Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. Lewis Hyman is an economic historian at the ILR School of Cornell University, where he is the Newfeld Professor in Industrial and Labor Relations. He also directs Institute for Workplace Studies in New York City, which focuses on issues surrounding the future of work. His most recent book is called Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream Became Temporary, which traces the rise and fall of secure work in the United States. So Lewis, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on, and obviously, you and your team have released this, uh, you know, pretty large and you know, I guess, newsworthy survey that's been in the news, and you know, a lot of drivers are talking about, it, and I think a lot of people in the industry. So I'm excited to dive into that. Before we do that, though, I kind of wanted to just quickly read off the overview. That's, uh, I believe, you know, I think it's the latest and greatest from your report, and uh, we'll also we'll be mentioning a lot of, you know, maybe figures and charts and numbers. So if people do want to, uh, you know, read that, I think uh, they can check out the report, and we'll leave all the links and things like that in the show notes too. So quickly, the overview um, that you listed off, the median driver, here's what you guys found. The median driver earned after expenses $23.25 per hour, close to Seattle, median hourly earnings of $25.45 and more than the median hourly of taxi drivers, which was $16.81. Nine in 10 drivers made more per hour than the average taxi driver, sixteen eighty one again, even after expenses. 92% of drivers make more than, than the Seattle minimum wage, $16.39 even after deducting expenses. 96% of drivers drove less than 40 hours per week, including driver wait time on the app. 31% were less than five hours. And for every $10 drivers gross, they had on average $1 in expenses. And finally, only a third of drivers use both Lyft and Uber. So Lewis, that's probably about the most I'm going to talk on this pad podcast. So I hope you're ready to take the mic. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm assuming by now, a lot of these numbers are kind of ingrained in your head and you can recite them off the top of your head and you don't even need to look at notes like I do, right? Uh, well, Harry, there's so many numbers in this report. We tried, as we'll talk about, I'm sure, we tried to get mm -hmm. uh, a set of data that allowed for different interpretations, different approaches mm -hmm. to different kinds of questions that people might ask. So even as there are you know, some numbers at the beginning, like you just said, it actually the story of the report is much more complicated and nuanced than simply saying drivers earn 23.25 an hour. Um, so I'm happy to get into that with you. And certainly in the media, there's been some pretty, uh, I think, mischaracterizations of what we found um, just mm -hmm. for sensational headlines. Yeah. Well, I will say one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the podcast is because a podcast, I think, is one of the best formats to go in depth into all of the nuances of your report. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head uh, that it was a 138 page report. So you guys obviously weren't messing around here. <laughs> a lot of data, a lot of figures, a lot of charts, but a lot of really interesting insights, too. And I think some unique um, approaches that you took and, of course, the findings, too. So I guess if we start at the top, I mean, you know, I, I listed off some of the findings. You gave a little bit of background. Background. Is there an overview of the report or the survey that you sort of use? I mean, was there specific goals or details that you had going into that? How do you kind of describe a 138 page report and, you know, kind of like a two cent, two or three sentence pitch? Yeah. So you would think that simply finding out how much drivers earn per hour would be a simple question, right? But as okay. soon as you say that, it becomes much more complicated because, you know, when does work start? When does it end? This is one of the main questions for drivers. And then when you think about earnings, um, you have to inevitably think about costs. And, yeah. and certainly there's lots of different ways you can approach costs. So a lot of the report is thinking about those issues, thinking about um, how what is the right way to think about costs? What is the right way to think about time? And mm -hmm. in the report, we took the approach of saying, look, different people who are reasonable have different ideas about this, about what they think is the right way to think about, for instance, driver wait time. You know, should it include time that doesn't lead to rides? If you're, you know, just on the app, you turn it on, you turn it off, you don't match up with a rider, should that in be included? Um, and different people have different opinions. And so mm -hmm. in the report, we included different ways to calculate driver wait time. We also talked about different ways to think about costs, you know, thinking about the differences between 
what the Seattle specific costs that we calculated, which we can go into if you want, um, mm -hmm. versus a sort of an average cost for all cars in America, which is the sort of standard way to think about um, IRS numbers and the Pared and Reich numbers. And yeah. uh, we can talk more in a complicated way about that. But I think the short answer is it's complicated and drivers yeah. know that. And we all know that that it really depends on your situation. And so we try to express that in the report. Very, yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's funny because that's probably one of the number one questions people also ask me is, you know, how much do drivers earn? And I say, okay, how much time do you have, right? It's a very <laughs> loaded question. And, you know, I think it'll be fun to kind of compare what you found and kind of what I've found anecdotally, because actually I think I saw a lot more overlap than, um, you know, maybe uh, I would have expected in sort of my anecdotal findings and, you know, the sort of anecdotal surveys we've done over the years and kind of what you guys ended up doing when we align a lot of the assumptions. And I think that's really, you know, one of the key things too, is that, you know, it really seems like what assumptions you make in a lot of these cases can really drive a lot of the numbers, no pun intended. So um, let's, let's start with some of the methodology, if you don't mind, sure. uh, you, you mentioned driver wait time. So if you want to just quickly uh, explain how driver, you know, the, the P1, P2, P3, I think most people understand, but just in case uh, some don't, I think that's, you know, just a, a good area to start and then kind of how you guys thought about driver wait time and how that influenced the, the findings. So in the industry, people refer to P0 as time when the app is off, P1 mm -hmm. when the app is on and drivers are waiting to be matched, uh, P2 when drivers are going to pick someone up and P3 when they're actually driving some around. Yeah. And what one of the unique things about our survey, or it's actually, it's not a survey, it's actually um, a population. So this wasn't mm -hmm. a survey of drivers. So many other um, reports are based on asking X number of drivers, how, much, how long they did, how they waited, you know, how much they earned yeah. about their time. And of course, there's all kinds of bias in that, um, that people yeah. who are, more frequently going to drive are probably more likely to answer. Um, mm. So that tends to show much more full-time drivers we would expect. Um, what's unique here is that we actually- So that would be a survey like mine. <laughs> no, and it's not bias, not in the sense of like ideological bias, but in yeah. the sense of just who responds to a survey, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. And what's amazing about this report, at least for me, and one of the reasons I did it was that I was offered all the data from Lyft and all the data from Uber, which allowed us mm -hmm. to line up individual drivers for the very first time. So we had anonymized uh, driver's license numbers so that we could actually merge together. So if somebody was driving on Lyft and then switched over to Uber, for the very yep. first time, we could see how that played out in terms of time. And uh, neither, if nor, neither Lyft nor Uber were able to have access to this data because of antitrust reasons. And so what it allowed us to do is actually see how much time people were spending on the platforms. And it was mm -hmm. very surprising. Got it. And yeah, I think that was definitely one of the things that stood out to me. I think that you guys were the first and maybe only report that, you know, because of the way that you got the, I guess it was anonymized data from drivers, but it had some sort of unique identifier that allowed you to see when they were basically online in P1 for both Uber and Lyft. And then of course, you know, I'm assuming once they got a ride, they went offline with the others. Although we have done, <laughs> there are some probably some weird cases where, you know, people are kind of leaving both apps on at, at times like that. But um, they definitely for the did. most part. Uh, this is this yeah. which sort of made the data very complicated because we had to, yeah. you know, and, and normally, in reports if somebody was had their Lyft app on and their Uber app on mm -hmm. and they're both on these apps for 10 minutes, you know, it counts as 20 minutes overall. But now because right. we can deduplicate that time, we can actually see how long people are actually driving, which is what matters most. Got it. And so I think earlier I mentioned a third of drivers use both Lyft and Uber, but I guess that's more just generally, you know, how many people are driving for both Uber and Lyft during that week, right? What, uh, what, what did you find as sort of the impact on P1 of this, you know, sort of overlap driving, if that makes sense? Yeah. So the, so the more that people tended to drive like long, more committed, longer hours, the mm -hmm. more they tended to multi-app. And so not surprisingly, it had a, the strongest effect on those people who drove longer hours. So we found that people who were driving about 40 hours a week, uh, about mm -hmm. a fifth of their P1 time got taken out by deduplication. And we found that for people who are multi-apping, uh, which is only about a third of the population, which is really interesting, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
it, it, it's reduced their time um, by about a third. So mm. this is a substantial correction to how we think about P1 time um, and we think about driver wait time. So what kind of impact, I guess, does that have on earnings? Because it's one third of your P1 time, which is, you know, maybe one third of your That's right. overall earning time. That's right? right. So it's about 10%, right? So a okay. third of 30% is 10%. So it yeah. reduces your time by about 10%. And so it naturally raises your hour, uh, it, you know, raises your hourly earnings by about the same amount. Gotcha. Okay. So that's driver wait time. You know, I think another, uh, you know, aspect that you guys looked at in the methodology was the costs, um, yeah. you know, basically that drivers were accruing. And, you know, I will say that a lot of the early studies, you know, sort of looked at earnings and it was kind of a bit silly, right, to produce a report on how much a drive, an Uber and Lyft driver is making if you don't take into account earnings. And so we saw a lot, you know, I think there was a lot of, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say fun poked at some of those early studies, but it just didn't give you really a full picture of uh, the earnings potential. But you guys did go go and look at costs. Is there anything that you want to elaborate on there as far as, you know, the, the cost side of how you looked at um, for drivers? Yeah. So we also knew that every driver's model, and again, we don't know the individual names or anything like that. We just right. know a unique identifier. I don't want anyone to think that I know what car people sure. are driving, um, but we knew exactly what kind of cars people were driving um, in the sense that it's anonymous. Um, and so unlike other studies, which rely, again, relied on survey data, relied on an average car, we were able to actually look at the individual cars people were driving and calculate maintenance for that car, huh. calculate depreciation for that car, calculate fuel mileage for that car. And, and so we, as much as possible, we tried to use the actual data. So we used the Seattle gas prices. This is only a survey for one week in the city of Seattle. I think that's really important to right. talk about. So these numbers you don't are suggestive for other places, but we're going to do more studies that allow us to actually yep. do this other places too. So um, for one week in Seattle, it was the case that uh, we used the right gas prices um, and for the cars and the depreciation. And the depreciation is a big part of this, right? I'm, I'm sure you've mm -hmm. talked about this with a lot of drivers, but yep. People don't take account of how much not just maintenance costs are, but the loss in value um, by driving an additional mile, right? Um, yeah. And so in our study, we use the same uh, data source that the state of Washington uses to calculate taxes. So the state of Washington, um, not all states do this, but in Washington, they tax you based on the value of your car. And so mm -hmm. we took that same data source um, and at the beginning and the end of 2019 and said, all right, well, for different years of model years of cars with different ish, initial mileages and, you know, tens of thousands of different, you know, different uh, miles driven in a year, how does that change the value of the car? Which is exactly the question we want to know. And we did a mathematical technique called regression, which allows us to isolate those effects. And so that's how we came to um, the depreciation mm -hmm. on the car. And it's important because a Prius actually has a very different depreciation rate um, and a fuel efficiency and all these other things than yeah. Ford F-150, which is the most common car in the United States and drives so many of the calculations because mm. that's what the IRS is estimating for. Oh, interesting. Actually, you know, I never, I never thought about that. They, I, I've heard the stat that the Ford F one fifty is the most popular, um, you know, car in America. I guess I don't know if you call it a car, but it's the most popular automobile Vehicle, in yeah. the United States. And of course, you know, the, the mileage reimbursement is fifty seven and a half cents per mile, I believe, this year. And I think that sort of smart business owners and you know some of the strategies we teach is telling drivers, you know, hey, if you do a great job deducting all your miles, your car costs a lot less than fifty seven point five cents per mile to operate. Right, for the most part, right? Yeah. Especially since you're typically more four door sedans and all of that. And there's obviously a cost, but I never, I guess, connected the two that, you know, why it's so high, if that makes sense. Well, you know, it's high because it's not really representative of like what Uber and Lyft drivers are using. That's exactly correct. And the fleet doesn't look that different, looks, uh, doesn't look that different from the very casual driver to the full time driver. Um, mm -hmm. And, but it looks substantially different from both what people drive in Seattle and really different than what people drive across the United States.
Got it. So I think the last thing that might be a little helpful to define um, is sort of your definitions of each drivers and kind of how you went about that. I know in the report you mentioned casual and casual committed and full time and part time. And I think there are four or five definitions, right? Do you want to quickly go over those and sort of what they mean? Sure. I mean, so one of the questions that you need to ask yourself is like, are there different experiences for different kinds of drivers from the guy mm -hmm. who drives a couple hours a week to somebody who drives 40 hours a week? Um, and how do yeah. those different kinds of drivers think about cost I'm sorry there's a bus going by I apologize if it makes no worries. the podcast more real it's, it's, it uh, sounds like we're yeah you're out in the wild so exactly I like um, <laughs> so um, what we did for our categories was that we wanted to think about how that driver wait time p1 changed across mm -hmm. different definitions and as we included it or excluded it or reduced it in different ways um, based on whether it led to a ride or didn't lead to a ride um, so we grouped the drivers by P2, P3. So we added together the time that they were driving to pick up people and the dry time they were driving people around. And we said, well, what are the, you know, top 5%, the, the next 20% of drivers, the next 50% of drivers, and then the next 25% of drivers. And it roughly corresponded, um, in the end with roughly what full-time drivers are, um, and part-time drivers. And, and in some sense, Maybe those should have been labeled differently as more committed and less committed. We talked about mm. that as well. But in the end, it, it came out that using when you included P1, that the full-time drivers had an average of about 44 hours a week, that the part-time drivers were in the low 20s, the uh, committed casual were about 10 hours a week, and then the um, most casual drivers were about two hours a week. And so 25% of the drivers are doing about two hours a week, about 50% of the drivers are doing about 10 or 11 hours a week, and so on yeah. and so forth. So that's one way to think about grouping the drivers. And we did it because we wanted to understand different ways of driver's wait time. Um, it doesn't exactly line up with how the state of Washington thinks about full-time drivers, though. So in Washington state, the cutoff for full-time is 32 hours a week. Um, mm -hmm. And we calculated that in a few different ways. Um, by the most capacious definition of P1, including all the wait time, everything else, um, you get about 15% of the population doing that kind of full-time driving. So 85% of drivers are not full-time. And mm -hmm. of course, the median driver in our population was doing about 10 hours a week. So fifth, yeah. half were doing more, half were doing less but the average was about 10 hours. Got it. Yeah, I think that was the thing that sort of initial, one of the things that stood out to me is it seemed like the number of full-time drivers was quite low. I guess if you include all of the P1, P2, and P3 time, it's 15%, which gets higher. Um, you know, I think that like around, you know, I think 15 to 25% is sort of what I would have guessed in the past and sort of what I've seen other studies look at. I know, uh, I guess there are two potential explanations that I saw, and I think we had briefly discussed, so I'd be curious to know what you think. Um, the first is, I'm curious, you know, in the past, I've seen Uber and Lyft use a very generous definition of active driver. You know, for example, when Lyft files their S1, they say we've got 800,000 drivers on the platform. They define an active driver as someone who's given one ride in the past six months, right? Mm. And so I think that's pretty generous. Um, I guess in this case, though, since you only looked at one week, did they have to have given at least one trip or how did that work? Yeah, so the data set that we had was every single driver who drove in the city of Seattle during that week. So, okay. so they had to have given at least one trip. Yeah. And we were looking at time in the city of Seattle. So one explanation mm -hmm. would be that, you know, one of the weird things about Seattle is that the major airport, SeaTac, is outside the city. Yeah. So if there are a lot of drivers who are spending a lot of time waiting at SeaTac, it's not included. So this is, makes it yeah. very different. And we're very clear about this in the report, by the way. It's not like this is, yes, it's listed. Oh, well, on, on page 47. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like it's listed in the report as like limits of the study. So this is not yeah. like, ooh, you got me here. Yeah, no, and, yeah. and you know that too, right? I mean, so I think some of the conversation on Twitter is a lot of, ooh, we got him. It's like, no, we, we listed yeah. that on page three. That's, we, we, <laughs> we yeah. know that. I know, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. No, um, no, and no, actually, so. No, what's, what's important, though, it's important though, because it speaks to the need for more research, because this could mm. be one of the reasons why it is lower. Um, so that a lot of drivers are maybe spending time at the airports or, you know, there's yep. a lot of corporate campuses outside of the city. So, you know, for the city 
but assuming this is true, then it's actually a very small part of the, the drivers. Um, mm. Just at odds with some of our intuition based on other cities. And of course, a lot of the intuition is based on studies of New York. But New York, yeah. if you've ever been to New York, yeah. which <laughs> you have been, it's nothing, it's nowhere like the rest of the country. Um, and so yeah. I fully believe that drivers in New York are more, are, are nearly all full time. Whereas I just yeah. don't think that's the case for other places where people already have cars. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, briefly, New York City is the only, you know, city in the U.S. that requires commercial insurance and TLC license. So that's three to five thousand dollars a year plus the licensing process. So it really doesn't make sense <laughs> to yeah. do part time there. So it's sort of a, an anomaly in, in that way. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that as far as, you know, sort of the I guess we were talking about the the P1, the P2, the P3, and the expenses that these drivers. Sorry, I sort of lost my train of thought. <laughs> what sorry my, about that. What my or, or, original thought was, but oh, the uh, you know sort of the number of full time drivers. Yeah, that second point is what um, I th what makes sense, right? Is that you know especially I would actually even say I don't know that that's unique. I think most cities the airport is actually outside of the city center very often, and that's one of the reasons why drivers like airport rides is because they're longer mm -hmm. and they're more lucrative, and mm -hmm. so they will wait there for 30 45 minutes or an hour hour and a half you know and especially some drivers i would even say sometimes maybe the more full-time drivers is i don't i really am not sure at this point i'm kind of guessing but um you know they, that may be a bigger part of their strategy even than some of the part-time drivers so it is uh you know interesting kind of like you mentioned that there are probably you know you can't study everything i guess right and that, that also brings up i mean the impetus of this study was what uh, I, mean, I mean, what was the impetus of the study? Like, what was it? I know the city of Seattle had a, you know, sort of competing, I guess you would say, study, which we'll talk about it in the future or you know, later on. But um, you guys were sort of looking to just focus on the city of Seattle or like, why didn't you look at the airport, for example? Yeah. So the city of Seattle requested information from Lyft and Uber and they mm -hmm. didn't want to give they gave them aggregate data, but they didn't want to give them um, the micro data of every single driver because there's mm -hmm. anti-competitive issues where it actually can't be public because then Uber and Lyft can look at their competition and that mm -hmm. we, that is antitrust behavior. Mm -hmm. we, they, they're not allowed to see what people are doing on the other platform. Um, so we had to be very careful when we were analyzing the data that we did, made sure that neither platform found out anything that would be considered anti-competitive information. Because as we know, it's already a duopoly. So we don't need to yeah. further reinforce the strength of one company yeah. or another. Go ahead. I guess, I guess my point is more, why, why wasn't the airport, for example, included? Oh, or, oh know, I'm sorry. Beyond yeah. the so city limits. I think this, the city of Seattle is looking to create a, a regu looking to regulate the rideshare industry. And they want to figure mm -hmm. out um, what people earn so they can think about an earnings floor. And so mm -hmm. for they don't regulate outside the city of Seattle. So they don't, mm -hmm. you know, it's not their purview to think about Tacoma. Hmm. And so yeah. one of the challenges we have is that, you know, the cities are the places where all this regulation is happening, but a lot of the experience of drivers is happening at the regional level or the state yeah. level. Um, yeah. And so, so yeah, so in some sense it's restricted to Seattle, but hopefully in future studies we can do metro area studies um, that allow mm -hmm. us to have a sense of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it makes sense. It's sort of right. If the city, well, I don't know that it makes sense, but I, I guess I understand their reasoning right. is that they're looking, if they're looking to study at what drivers are making in the city of Seattle, because that's what the city they care about. But on the ground, if drivers, you know, are spending 10, 20 or 30% of their time at their airport, it's a pretty important part of their earnings picture. So yep. uh, I, I think it kind of, you know, maybe was a, a potential flaw of their design and their kind of study to not include that or not look at that. And, uh, you know, it's actually it's I've got an upcoming chapter in an academic book that sort of talks a lot about these types of business license issues and that it's basically just not like kind of really understanding you know studying these issues and then not you know quite understanding the reality of a life you know a life on the ground for a driver but that's a totally uh, separate rant that we can talk about on another day <laughs> but I think it's important because I mean for a lot of drivers they are moving between places these different regulatory places right. they're moving between jobs um, and a lot of ways, the idea of a fixed place, a fixed job, this is a very old economy way of understanding the lives of working people. And mm -hmm. what's important, and the reason I did this, did this report is that I, I think it's important for drivers to get a sense and policymakers to get a sense of what's really going on. So um, 
Yeah, and yeah. so that's that's what I hope to comes out of this. Yeah, here, please go ahead. Got it. Cool. And I, I guess as a bonus question, you know, I, I do think, you know, we were talking off air for a second, you know, the last thing that we sort of missed, and I think we, we should address because there was some controversy over this is sort of the fact that, you know, Uber, um, I guess Uber was the one who kind of compensated the university for this. Is that right? And... Uber and Lyft, they, they paid 50-50. Okay, so Uber and Lyft paid for this. So what are the details on there? Because I know personally, I didn't find this as much of an issue at all. But I know some people were looking at this as like, can't trust the data. I couldn't disagree more, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I didn't receive any money. Neither did anyone on my team, except mm -hmm. for the grad students who were universally paid less than the average Uber or Lyft driver. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Unfortunately, um, we would at least like to give them the median, which we couldn't do. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of, it, there's a cost plus contract. It's very standard, any kind of academic research, mm -hmm. you know, that's done all the time with pharmaceutical companies. It's done all the time with other corporations. It's perfectly normal to cut because universities, it, you have to pay your workers, right? So yep. there's people who set up and run the secure computing center. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of ancillary overhead. And so I didn't get paid an extra dollar. Speaking of marginal earnings, I didn't get, you know, no one else in my other the faculty didn't get paid any extra and we didn't get any extra research money. Um, and so I don't even know where that money went. Um, it certainly it. didn't go to me and the university, you know, nobody cares if I got it. It's just sort of a standard practice. So, yeah. you know, hopefully going forward, we don't have to do that because it seemed to really rub a lot of people the wrong way. Um, but you know, it does take money to do work. Um, right. so and I mean, I guess what I would even say sort of coming down on your side is, you know, $120,000 for the scope of, you know, this 138 page report. And I've done, you know, reports or, you know, surveys that probably pale in comparison to the work that you guys have done. And I know how much work it is and probably how much more thorough you guys were. I, I think if anything, it wasn't even in close to enough to cover the costs and the time and all that. But I guess it does bring up sort of the issues of, you know, for example, like how, you know, there've been a couple articles about how universities work with Uber and Lyft. Like how did they pick this week or this city in the first place, you know, even, you know, to even, you know, start with, right. And like kind of some of those issues. I mean, do you have any insight into sort of like kind of how this this report, you know, even came about in that sense. Like, why did they pick you as, uh, you know, your team, or you know, versus someone yeah, else? Yeah. Right? So um, they picked me because I wrote this book, Temp, um, mm -hmm. which was a sort of critical history of the gig economy, in which I refer to Uber as the waste product of the service economy. Um, <laughs> so I didn't come down on Uber and Lyft being great. And personally, you know, it would have been a lot easier for me if I could have said, yeah, they make drivers make five dollars an hour, but mm -hmm. you know got to tell the truth the data is, yeah. the data is what the data is and if you think of a report that comes out saying that full a quarter of full-time drivers are not making the minimum wage is some kind of fawning phrase of yeah. these these platforms I, I don't know what you expect um and also the idea that drivers are making five dollars an hour just seem drivers must all be really stupid if that's the <laughs> case um and they're yeah. not stupid right which is why i wrote this report because they can look at the data themselves and see where they fit um, but in terms of the money, it's, um, it just seemed like a dodge to me, um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's not that much money in the scope of these multi-billion dollar corporations. Yeah. Um, and even to a university, you know, nobody noticed that this happened. So, right. um, I'd, I'd rather people engage with the findings, um, and with the facts and, and not with the sort of conspiracy theories about yeah. this. Fair. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, so we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the sort of things, you know, so maybe some of the issues or I mean, what, what you know, some of the, you, you mentioned the Twitter, you know, people <laughs> mentioning on that, which I don't know how representative of real life that is. But uh, what, what criticisms have you seen um, with these reports that maybe some you agree with, maybe some that you don't? Well, there are people who want the, the earnings to be as low as possible to mm -hmm. further their own political agenda. Um, and mm -hmm. they say drivers earn five dollars an hour. And the answer is, yeah, some drivers earn five dollars an hour. But on average, mm -hmm. they don't. Um, and if they earn, if, I think if every driver earned five dollars an hour, they would stop driving. Um, yeah. But I think I think for me, one of the things that came out of this was the way in which people talked about that number $23 and 25 cents mm -hmm. and it's a median. And so if you remember from your math classes, that means half the drivers are more half the drivers earn less. So yeah. one of the things that's weird about the data we saw, and as I'm sure you saw in the report was that 
you know, if you work a normal job at a Starbucks or a McDonald's, the person sitting next to you earns about maybe 50 cents more, 50 cents less for exactly mm. the same job. Whereas the driver next to you could be earning $40 an hour when you're earning $9 an hour. And so what, what statisticians call the distribution was just enormous. So mm. we, can, we reported um, those medians, but really the story is in the graphs in the report that show the widespread of earnings. And for me, that was the real astonishing thing, just how different the earnings were for different drivers. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I will say that this part in a weird way kind of excited me because this is really kind of the crux of my whole business is that the more knowledge you have as a driver, the more insight you have, the more money you can make. And it's the reason, you know, sort of why I have the blog, the podcast, YouTube channel for drivers, why we have a course, why we have a book. And in surveys we've done, you know, we've actually seen that drivers with, I think, 2,000 rides or more earn $5 an hour more mm -hmm. than drivers with 500 rides or less, or at least they reported earning $5 an hour more. And I think that was exactly what I saw in your survey. And you actually mentioned it in the updated brief too, that you know there are some drivers in Seattle during this week that made over $40 an hour, and there are some that made under $10 an hour, which I think is, I never realized that the split, you know, I thought it was maybe 2X, maybe 3X, but I mean, that's a 4X split. So a driver who, you know, sort of, I, I guess what I would say is like a driver who sort of know, really knows what they're doing and kind of is driving the best times and the places and getting maybe the best bonuses or incentives or whatever versus the person who clearly doesn't know <laughs> what they're doing mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe is forced into driving those hours or can only work those hours, whatever the reasons are, there's a 4X difference. That's pretty amazing. That, that really stood out to me. And what's shocking too is that our earnings data from Uber and Lyft didn't include streaks or bonuses or any of that. So this hmm. is before people who apply that kind of knowledge as well. So, so this didn't include any of the weekly bonuses. I mean, Seattle no. is sort of a medium to large market. So it's not, you know, a market where drivers are super dependent on bonuses, but they definitely have, bon you know, weekly bonuses in the cities. Yeah. So we didn't have that um, in hmm. the earnings. So for people who could do that, they, they probably earn more. Um, but yeah, it was it was an astonishing difference, and hopefully, in future reports, we'll have access to data that tells us driver tenure. You know, how mm -hmm. long have people yeah. been driving for? And I, that's exactly one of the things we want to investigate. Um, and not just, and this is another reason why it's so important to have data from both platforms, because the techniques for Uber will I'll probably also apply to techniques from Lyft. And so, if you've been driving. It, you yeah. know, a thousand rides, it could be 500 on both or 200 on, or 50 on one and 150 on the other. So it, it's important to have data from both platforms to analyze that. Yeah. So I think maybe, you know, and kind of I'll ask you just a few more questions, but I, I would like to look at let's I mean, we can take the twenty three, twenty five dollar an hour, which was the median. And maybe we can just break that down because I know that in the report you provide, you know, different. I think you guys did do a really good job of providing, you know, based on your assumptions, you can kind of calculate all these different variations. So if people are interested in that, they can kind of go through and do that. But if we look at the twenty three, twenty five number, um, you know, how does that I guess, first off, I mean, that's earnings after expenses. Right. So what were the expenses in that case? So. So, so it's really important when you're thinking about these the driver's expenses, we think, is to break it into marginal costs and fixed costs. And this is just very okay. normal stuff that economists usually do. So a marginal cost would be something that costs you money every time you do an activity. So if I'm driving, I need to think about fuel and I need to think about the maintenance of the car and its depreciation per mile um, and insurance if I'm driving it. And that costs, there's a marginal cost of that, that I wouldn't mm. otherwise have um, unless I were doing the activity. And a fixed right. cost is, you know, whether or not you're doing the activity, you still have to pay for it, right? And so mm -hmm. a fixed cost would be um, owning the car. It would be buying, the, you know, owning the, owning the car, you know, in general. It would be um, having personal insurance. It would be a lot of the things we associate with the cost of a car. Um, so what we did was that for a very casual driver, so a lot of the other studies have started with the assumption that people are full-time drivers. And if you do that, mm -hmm. it makes sense to include fixed and marginal costs. But for a casual driver who's driving a few hours a week, it really doesn't make sense. If they are doing this, it's because they already have a car. Um, they mm -hmm. are taking the car they already have. Yeah, it's I think cost. I uh, agree with that. Yeah, and so they are driving a few more hours and they're thinking, how much does this cost me in fuel and maintenance and depreciation and insurance? And so those are mm -hmm. the costs we included 
for the drivers in Seattle who are casual, non full time drivers. And for the full time drivers, we said, look, once someone's driving full time, they are actually thinking about what kind of car to own. They're thinking about mm-hmm. buying a different car. They're thinking about um, those kinds of fixed costs. And so we include those fixed costs. Um, and really, in, in reality, it's a spectrum, right? So the guy who drives- and, and I mean, also, it's sort of the primary way that they're using that car, right? If right. they're doing full-time driving, they're gonna be putting 1,000 miles a week on their car. It doesn't leave a whole lot of other miles. You know, Maybe you drive 50, 100 miles personally, so 90% of the time, you're using that car for Uber and Lyft, right? Yeah, and this is a pretty normal way to think about business okay. expenses. Um, this is the yep, normal way you think about business expenses. Um, and so for full-time drivers, we actually had a different cost model. So for the 20 through 25, it's based on the average driver who's driving 10 hours a week, who is, um, you know, and that is just marginal costs. This is somebody who mm-hmm. is doing it. They are doing it. They already have a car. I mean, you're not buying a car and then driving it 10 hours a week. Got it. Right. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but you are driving full time, you should include the cost of the car. And so what we did in our uh, study, which is a very normal economic technique, is we looked at the rental cost, uh, the market price rental cost. So what would it cost mm-hmm. to rent a car for a week? Um, and that gives you the most expensive minimum car to drive on a platform, um, mm-hmm. which if you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, that would be, the most expensive way to do this. Um, and it starts the before taxes and fees, it's $214 a week. And so mm-hmm. we started adding in all that stuff, the taxes and fees. We took out the maintenance. We took out the depreciation because that's part of what you're right. paying for, for a full-time uh, rental. Um, mm-hmm. And then when you do all that, it brings down the hourly earnings of a full-time driver to about $18. In, if it. you include only the time before rides, and then if you include all the wait time, it brings it down to seventeen forty an hour. So mm-hmm. it's lower. It's lower yeah. than that casual driver. And we wondered, in fact, if this is maybe why there are so few full-time drivers, that drivers mm-hmm. being rational are saying, well, actually, I'm making less money the more I do this, that there's that sweet spot yeah. where they make good money in the middle. So yeah. that's basically how we thought about that model. Got it. So that's helpful. So basically the 23, 25 an hour is sort of saying that the expense, you know, cal- you know, number that we calculated to get to 23, 25 is kind of based off a of more of a marginal cost. Right. So and which I think I agree with. Right. You know, most people that are doing this casually already have a car and, you know, they already probably even have a cell phone. There might be, you know, very small amounts extra that they have to pay for data, but it's pretty, you know, small. Um, and then versus the full time drivers who actually, you know, when you do take more of a fixed uh, you know, cost approach, they're actually a lot lower, 17 to $18 an hour because cars are expensive, right? Yeah. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that was probably one of the things that got lost in the headline and what I would even in the headlines, what I would even say is, you know, a lot of the drivers that are sort of, you know, more pro on the labor side and pro employee and sort of all of that, you know, I think they tend to be more in the full-time driver camp because they're, you know, frankly, like you can see here, even with your numbers, like the job is $5 an hour less, five to $6 an hour less attractive to them them as a full-time driver, right? And it should be said also that that would be the lowest possible. In some sense, it's more of a lower bound because, you know, if you're spending, and I think, I forget the exact number, but it's about $300 a week in rental. Um, It's $1,200 a month. (laughs) So I'm sure you can get uh, a lease on a Corolla for less than $1,200 a month. So well, I actually, that, that's actually one thing I would push back on. You can't get a lease for 1200 a month, you know, because it, you know, you would go over the mileage limit, right? Because mm. normal leases only have 10,000 miles a year. And one thing that I've sort of been thinking about a lot over the past year or two with all of these, you know, the sort of explosion of these vehicle rental companies, mm-hmm. I actually think it's not a bad, the worst deal in the world, because sometimes these are sort of priced maybe a little lower than they should be at 200, 250 a week. You know, I think it actually might even make sense for drivers that are doing 50 hours a week to consider, um, you know, kind of renting instead of owning a car themselves. But maybe that, again, you know, that that, that might be another potential uh, <laughs> topic for the future. Um, yeah. The, the, no, I mean, you know, I, the last, I, I mean, or buying a car simply. I mean, I, I mean, I think, yeah. but I think what we do know is that that would be the, if you're paying more than that, you shouldn't, right? If you're yeah. paying more than 1200 a month, you shouldn't be paying that, right? You should be renting a car instead, which I think is exactly your point. By the time someone, yeah 
is doing this as a bit full-time business, they should be thinking about that, those kinds of things. So, you know, that's what the report takes into account as well. Got it. So the last sort of major topic I want to ask you about the report is, uh, I guess the P1, P2, P3 time and sort of the, I mean, I mean, again, I think you guys did a good job providing the different options, you know, like you said, right, including all, but I mean, even if I look at the 23, 25 an hour number, that was P2, P3 and P1 before, if you didn't get a ride, is that right? Uh, only if you included rides. So or only if you included a ride. Yeah. So I guess in my mind, to me, P1, P2, P3 seems like all time that drivers should be, you know, I consider that like on the clock. I think there's very few situations where drivers are sort of, you know, sitting there, you know, online and they don't get a ride and they go home, right? Especially if it's limited to the city of Seattle, because most drivers live, you know, they can't afford to live in a high mm -hmm. cost of living area like Seattle. So I guess my first question is how much of an impact did that have on the earnings and why not include, you know, all of that uh, P1 time? Well, we devoted 20 or 30 pages of the report to exactly that question. So it's, Got it. there's a whole section of the report and we devoted, we wrote it different ways so that people who had different opinions um, could. But I mean, I guess what I would say, I mean, your opinion since yeah. sort of the headline was 23, 25 an yeah. hour and it wasn't that, you know, P1 plus P2, P3. So I, I mean, and again, right, like I think you guys did do, you know, all of the different variations, but obviously, you know, you felt or the team felt that that was most representative. So that's kind of what I'm curious um, to dig into that. Yeah, no, I think. And so the question is, we know for sure that people are working when it leads to a ride. We know that they are right. not doing something else. Um and we also know that a lot of the time when people have the apps on, they're waiting for other kinds of things to happen, right? That's what the multi-apping, these are the kinds of drivers who are also, maybe they're doing DoorDash, maybe they're doing Uber Eats, maybe they're doing lots of other mm. things. Um, we don't well, know. I guess I would, I don't know that they're doing lots of other things. I think mainly Lyft. I mean, yeah. some might be doing delivery services and all that, but yeah, I think there's probably some crossover there. That's a good point. I think it's perfectly reasonable uh, to have that position. Um, and the answer for me is more research that we want to mm. delve deeper into the P1 times. So if that, if the P1 times that are not leading to rides are at the end of the day, you know, mm. they're, you know, or are, um, you know, at the beginning of the day or are very, very short, um, you know, there's different ways we can yeah. understand the meaning of that. Um, and I, I guess I'm just trying to think about like the real life situation where I'm driving in the city of Seattle and I'm in P1 and I turn the, I mean, basically it's like I turn the app off, right? Like why would, I'm just trying to think why that would happen. It wouldn't, most drivers don't live in the city, so they wouldn't be going home or coming from, I mean, of course there's probably some, but I think it's in, in the minority. So I, I don't know if you, you thought it through that um, deep, but that's sort of just where I'm coming at it from the driver's side. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't want to come down on the side of saying this is one way to think about it, this is another way. Mm -hmm. And in some sense you're right that we shouldn't have said 2325, we should have said the other number which I think is more like $21 an hour. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I guess that that's my other point. Like it's still not a huge variation. <laughs> I mean, it's $2 yeah. an hour, it's 10%. Um, but yeah, that, that, uh, and, and again, I think so I'll, I'll sort of, we can kind of close this, this out. And I mean, you guys did do a great job providing, um, you know, all of the different charts and options and variations. And I think the updated report that you released has a nice two to four page brief that really, uh, clearly and succinctly explains everything. Um, you know, I think the last thing I wanted to quickly ask you, and then I'll let you go mm -hmm. is if you could do it all over again, you know, this whole survey from, you know, kind of day one, w would you do anything differently? Or are you pretty happy with the way it turned out? Um, I, yeah, there's different things I would do differently. This is the first time I've written such a public facing report. I've written mm -hmm. many books before, um, an economic historian. Um, but it's the first time I've written this kind of like contemporary report on these kinds of issues. I think I would have foregrounded the variation from the start. I think I would mm -hmm. have, um, push harder. I actually asked for the metro area data um, for exactly that reason. And they said, you know, the companies were like, well, this is not what Seattle wants. Just do this. Um, mm -hmm. I would have pushed harder for that because I think it actually is an important part of the question. Um, and I would have, I think, um, not come down saying one way or the other, which of these different estimates was preferred. I would have just said, look, Got it. this is how, if you believe this, this is what it should be. Um, uh, in some sense, uh, I was sort of, I, and this is, I don't want to say this exactly, but like there's a way in which because it was going to the media, there needed to yeah. be 
key findings. Uh, there need yep. to be a few things as opposed to a place where I'm more comfortable as a scholar just saying, look, there's different ways you can think about this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and I guess in my naivete, I thought, well, we're so lucky to have access to this data. And mm -hmm. I know that different people who are reasonable people think differently about it. So we're just going to yeah. analyze it um, and provide different approaches so that everybody with, can come to it with their own assumptions and find the answers that they need, which is the goal just to get more better information out there for drivers so they understand the range of experiences. You know, yeah. one of the things we found was that with the full-time model, 26% of drivers who are full-time are making less than the minimum wage, yeah. right? So that's, that is true even though the median is higher than the minimum wage. And I think that right. is hard for some people to understand that it doesn't mean everybody's earning $18 an hour. In fact, it means a quarter of the people are making less than the minimum wage. Um, yeah. And even in the, when you just look at marginal costs, 8% of the drivers are earning less than the minimum wage. So that's mm -hmm. a lot of people. So I think part of the things that I, I, if I had to do all over again, and thank you, thank you for asking it, Harry, um, I, I would start with variation over the average. Cause I really think that is the, ex yeah. and, one, and the key question is why is there so much variation? That's one of the things we're going to hope to get yeah. into with the company's data um, going forward. And hopefully that'll benefit drivers so they can make better choices and make more money. Yeah, definitely. Well, I will. I will say, you know, I think this is, uh, you know, one of the more, if not most, uh, thorough reports we've seen. You know, sort of looking obviously with the combination of the data from the companies, but I think also including the different variations. And like you said, you know, always the the media may uh, latch on to certain figures that are a little more eye dropping or jaw dropping, eye popping, jaw dropping. But uh, there is a lot of information. That's one thing I appreciated is that you know drivers really can get a lot more insight into their work and sort of you know the conditions. Um, and that's sort of what I wanted to do with this podcast and this video. So really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I think definitely, you know, I, I'm hoping that in the future we'll see a lot more uh, research because I think as we uncovered in this interview, there's probably at least uh, 50 things more that we could look at, right? <laughs> there are so many things, so many interesting things. And I, I can't wait to be on the show again with the next report. All right, Lewis, take care. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.